My name's Roland Welker from Red Devil, Alaska. I just turned 48 years old in October. I'm originally from the Appalachia Hills of central Pennsylvania, Clearfield County, central Pennsylvania, hillbilly heaven. I flew the coop from Clearfield. Shiloh is actually our little town. Clearfield was the school, the big town nearby, if you want to call it that. I flew the coop early. I, I blowed out at 17. I graduated high school from 17, so that gave me a little leg up. But I had been itching to get on with my life from like 13 on. At 13, I started doing pretty heavy stuff for a 13-year-old. Alaska drew me from the get-go. Not only just because of the way I'm made, but my father put the Alaska bug in my head at a very young age. It was his dream. He was, uh, you know, his day was in the 70s and they were still doing some homesteading in Alaska in the 70s where you could just go get some land. And then I remember him and his brother, my Uncle Jim, talking about Alaska and this homestead they wanted to go do. And they would plan this out, but then... So, me and Dad was tight. He would be talking all his Alaska schemes over with me. So I was six, seven, eight years old, just sucking it up like a sponge, and was already, you know, very active in the outdoors, leaning toward that lifestyle. So that, that a lot of it has to do with the old man. I was come, I, I got to Alaska a little later than I should have. I, I should have tackled it right out of high school. I, I went to the army and worked all around the country until I was 24. I was, I was working in Kentucky, I believe, at the time. And, and I thought, I thought, man, I just, you know, I was having a ball party and I thought, I, and then I was recapturing Alaska dream. I sort of lost it through the party years. I lost the vision. I bought a 1981 Ford pickup, which was 10 or 12 years old at the time or 13. And uh, they had just opened the Dalton Highway to Prudhoe Bay, the Arctic Ocean. Before, you always had to stop at Wiseman, and I knew that, because I, even though I wasn't, even though I was caught in the daily grind, so to speak, I still read everything I could get a hold of. But uh, avid reading's been a big part of my life too. So I knew that the highway never went to the Arctic Ocean, but there was an article, and I believe it was Sports of Field explaining how they opened that highway clear to the Arctic Ocean, and I thought, I'm gonna get in my truck and I'm gonna drive to Alaska, and I'm gonna drive to the Arctic Ocean, and I'm gonna stay up there forever. And I, kinda, I did that, I did, I, I drove that, and I, I went out, I spent another few months getting ready, ordering gear and loading that truck with everything, put extra springs on my truck to take the load. I mean, I took my traps, my guns, my clothes, my whole outfit, grossly overloaded for a six-cylinder three-speed. I was in second gear screaming up over the medicine bows on Interstate 80. And another homesteader was in front of me and I went to pass him. He was in an El Camino with a pool behind and kids and shit. And we were both doing like 35 on Interstate 80. By the time I finally got out around, I had to shut the CB off. They were just bitching. And I find, by the time I finally ducked in front of that homesteader, pa traffic passed us for, I know, 15 minutes steady. and. Uh, I made my way to Washington, Bellingham. I got a ticket on the inland, and the Alaska Marine Ferry System and took that up to Haines, drove into Canada, and came out at Delta Junction, drove to Fairbanks, and it's, it's early May, so it's getting, you know, it's still chilly up there. And I hung out in Fairbanks a day or two, and then I got on the Dalton Highway and started heading north. I struck the Yukon River with my whole rig, Roads were getting slimy, lots of trucks, big bridge over the Yukon. That's the Yukon River Bridge truck ca crossing on the Hall Road. There's a garage there and a, you know, the work camp was there back in the day when they built all that. Well, then that work camp got taken over by an entrepreneur and he had, of course, a hotel and a restaurant. But it ain't like a hotel and restaurant you think in your mind. And the, these are connexes all connected together in a big steel building. Anyway, the Yukon River was actually just breaking up. The ice was going out of the Yukon River as I drove across that bridge. You know how rare that could be to actually hit that point 
of that river as that ice was going out. I was so damn green, I stopped and got gas and fucking he kept heading for the Arctic Circle. Because I don't know, I wanted to go to the Arctic Circle and Prudho Bay. Or well, somewhere around the Arctic Circle, the road got so bad that I just pulled in, spent the night at the Arctic Circle, and the next day, I mean, it was snowing and everything. Still winter up there. And I went back to that bridge. Of course, the ice is all gone by now. And I, they were going to put a man on for the summer. And even though I already had a job lined up in August to uh, go uh, packing for an outfitter, I uh, talked him into putting me on for two months, and I spent the summer hanging out there. I had that job lined up with the man's name was Wayne Woods and he operated Woods Outfitting and he operated in Western Alaska out of Palmer which is not Western Alaska Palmer is just a town in the Matanuska Valley uh, I don't know 40 miles outside of Anchorage or so but you know he's a full-blown outfitter he was a big man I, I came into his outfit when he was in his prime he was probably just a little younger than I am now. And he had a big year coming up, a big year. He had like 20 or 30 hunters coming that fall. He had an airplane lined up. He had all his camps already out there from the year before his gear cached. And uh, he hired, I think, three assistant guides. And a couple of them might have actually been registered, but he hired them. And then he had three, he hired three packers, and I was one of them. I called him up. He ran an ad in the uh, National Trapper, which my uncle got. And I was a big trapper in Pennsylvania. And I, don't, I mean, I was already coming. So uncle gives me that and says, hey, this dude's looking for help. And I called him three or four times and nailed that job before I ever left Pennsylvania. Truck was already loaded and shit. So I, I did the whole Yukon thing and then drove clear down from Fair Yukon, Fairbanks, Oh, that summer I did proceed then, when I was working at that gas station, I did proceed on up to Prudhoe Bay and was at the Arctic Ocean. That was kind of my goal for the summer. So anyway, then I drove, after the work was done at the garage, I give him my two-week notice. He knew I was leaving in August, drove clear down to Palmer, and we started loading airplanes for western Alaska. I'd never been in western Alaska, of course. I was thinking north. And when we took that two or three hour airplane ride out across nothing and there's another whole story to that that could be told later that somewhere along the line remind me to tell you about getting across the Alaska range after partying in Palmer for seven straight days it's a great story so we they they land and spew me and this other packer out with all this gear that was the initial trip he just told us where to set up a tent and kind of get ready for more loads I did my first night out there alone with another packer i'll never forget it moose walking through camp grizzly bears on the hillsides this was real country this was and i would you know been traveling and been in the west and been around even at 24 that's how old i was but i mean this was real country a country a man could roam around in forever and still not get his fill of it this is what as soon as i hit there i kind of know this was it i knew i wasn't leaving did the whole season, non-stop adventure, you know, clients whacking moose and caribou and grizzly bears. We were skinning them and packing them out. Super cub rides, other outfitters swarm. You know, the whole, the whole place was at a game peak. That's another part of the story. The whole place was at a game peak. There was outfitters swarming from all over the state to this part of Alaska. So it was high competition too, even though there's a lot of game. And then I stayed on for that even to this day and, and I watched that whole place get wiped out by hunting and wolves it was a it was from both the wolves moved in at the same time for some reason thick thick with wolves you could watch wolves just taking down caribou in your binoculars in the middle of the day like something you'd see on TV so how does a man full of the blood lust couldn't get enough hunting his whole life leave something like that I mean it was like John Denver singing Rocky Mountain High, coming home to a place he'd never been before. Epic. My influences go way back to the founding fathers of America, the frontiersmen, the settlers that wrestled this 
wilderness, wrestled this civilization out of the wilderness, and created everything everybody's enjoying now. Those are my figures that I try to emulate. And then, and then you move up closer to my actual family members. My whole family's been involved in the woods and living off the land, so to speak, in an industrial sense, you know, from day, for ever since we came here, mining and, and uh, logging. I try to live up to the old timers. The old timers are my benchmark. They had it rough. The old timers had it rough. Even me, that everything I've done cannot appreciate what they had to go through to create all the comforts that we enjoy now, to wrestle a civilization out of the wilderness. We just can't understand what they went through because we've not had to endure that. Even me, that I'm out there in the woods all the time, but I, I got way better tools than our forefathers had, and I can always bounce back into civilization and, and then go back when I want, you know. They were stuck in the wilderness all the time. The old timers is my, is who I've tried to emulate my whole life. Currently, I'm making a living guiding hunters in western Alaska. I stuck with it long enough to get my registered guide license. Just this year, actually, I be, last year I became eligible for master license but yeah i make my living taking high dollar hunters into the wilderness in pursuit of moose grizzly bear doll sheep once in a while caribou main the big three is moose uh, doll sheep and grizzly bear They're, those are the ultimate trophies on the north america continent counting my assistant years I've, and my packing year i've been doing that 23 years 23 years of traipsing around the north. I can do five hunts a year, sometimes six or seven if I'm booked up really hard, but I, I, I like to shoot for five hunts. That's 60 days in a tent right there. Each hunt's 10 days and then you got some prep before and after. And then if you add in all my trapping and my gold mining, I'm, I'm spending at least 180 days outdoors. A year. I'm spending half a year every year outdoors. These hunts and are the distance traveled is mind-boggling to get into these secluded areas with these good animals. And then, so you got all the piloting, the the entrance with the gear and the extraction. It's almost like we're the ninja warriors of the hunting world, you know going in or the recon of the hunting world you know going in getting the animal and getting out getting in with weather and and you know lining up the pilot and hoping there's no mechanicals and the runways are good you know they can be wet and things and then getting the animal and getting it skunt and, and preserved making calls on sat phone you know you're hundreds of miles away from your pilot trying to get somebody to come get you get your ass out of there before the next weather front comes in or you're also ducked down there in your shitty little tent for another whole storm front you know the weather is huge okay you got that whole aspect so entrance and extraction is huge into the in the real wilderness and then you got the the process of getting that animal having these big trophy males targeted that's what you want giant moose 60 inch is what we're looking for we'll take smaller but not much smaller and 60 is big 72 is my biggest we're looking for eight foot bears brown bears not blacks by the time somebody comes and hunts alaska they've shot black bears somewhere else. anyway so we're looking for eight foot brown bears or to 10 and i'm hunting interior my biggest is nine foot eight which is fucking phenomenal there's another whole story i could tell on that bear and uh doll sheep you know these are white sheep these are white animals they're white year round they're they're more proliferant than the big horns and stuff big horns down south yeah. smack two or three of them every year these are eight year old eight year olds the minimum they hit full curl eight some seven year olds hit full curl but man they're hard to judge most sheep when they hit full curl that we kill are from eight to 11 years old that is an old animal these are old uh 
trophy, highly desirable animals. Some of the rarest, highest desirable animals on this continent. You, you gotta, in the world, I'd put doll sheep and grizzly bears and giant moose up against anything worldwide. So I, I'm dealing with some pretty big clients because you gotta have some dough to go do this kind of stuff. And I'm dealing with some real heavy responsibility getting them in and out safely. Then on top of that, you got the licensing in Alaska. It, it's high stress. Every year when it's over, two months of straight hunting under these conditions, when it's finally over and I got this last dude on an airplane heading south, and I finally catch a ride out with all my shit, I'm like, whew, did it again. So I'm used to operating under high stress. God, you got the trophy handling. We, we, got no res, we got no refrigeration of any kind out there. I take in 25 pound bags of salt. You have to be able to set down with that hide. We call it knee fleshing. You get him up on your knee, eight foot bear skin, a moose cape. You know, moose cape, it weighs 100 pounds. That's damn near as big as an eight foot bear. So you sit there. Now, if there's an airplane coming and it's time for the dude to go, if everything's lining up, you can throw him and his raw cape on the airplane and, you know, he has to get it to someplace in Anchorage. Well, if you're stuck with weather or if you got two hunters in camp and there's still one looking for an animal, on top of everything else, I got to sit down with my knife and take every piece of flesh off that bear skin. I mean every piece. Get it down to where it's going to take salt. Yeah, turn the ears inside out. Turn the lips inside out. Turn the whole nose inside out. On a moose, it's like this big. A bear ain't too bad. It's, tur it's called turning the head. Take all the hands out of the bear and all the feet and then turn all them toes inside out. It's a process, man. And then when that's all done, when you finally get it turned, then you salt it. And so for a day or two, it bleeds salt water. You gotta watch you don't roll up a salty hide and shove it in somebody's airplane. No better way to get a pilot not to fly for you again to shove a salty bear hide in his airplane then it leaks salt down into his controls and shit and there's a lot going on out there a lot there.